let's move on to the second session uh, uh, of our conversation. And here you have written extensively on an, an aspect which uh, uh, we are very interested in, which is basically the impact of AI on jobs. And uh, you have touched on a very important uh, element there, which is that absorption of skills uh, basically commoditizes uh, that skill and it actually reduces the uh, capacity for the uh, individual or the job owner to negotiate. It also reduces the wage level of that skill over a period of time. And, you know, we've seen this uh, happening. Uh, I have seen this happening in the space of design. I've seen this happen in the space of journalism. Uh, I've seen this happen in the space of data collection. Elaborate this conundrum for us, for a lay uh, reader or a lay listener. You know. Sure, absolutely. So I think it's uh, helpful if we, again, use the same framing that I used at the beginning, that any new technology can be just a tool or it can have uh, a learning effect where it learns and improves its ability to become a tool as the human uses it more. Or they can be, uh, you know, the technology can also uh, do market mediation. And so the more we move across the spectrum of where the technology sits, uh, the more its impact on jobs and wages starts coming in. So if I take uh, the first part, you know, a technology is just being a tool. Uh, if a technology is just a tool, uh, even then it essentially can play one of two roles. It can either replace you as a worker or it can augment you. Now, a lot of people think that replacement is bad, augmentation is good. My key yeah. point over there is that augmentation also has a negative effect because yeah. once uh, you get augmented, the first effect of augmentation uh, in a wide variety of scenarios and, and there are clear uh, boundaries on what those scenarios are, but in a wide variety of scenarios, the first effect of augmentation is that it brings down the skill level that is required to do that task. And because of that, the the players who are not at a certain skill level are able to up level much higher and the players who are who had developed unique skill level are not able to gain that additional advantage that they had developed so in general uh, the market of possible workers for that skill expands and there are many examples you know when we went from the axe to the chain so uh, that's uh, when, when you were using the axe, you had to have right. muscular strength. You also had to have some technique of how you hit and then how you fell the tree. But with a chainsaw, anybody could do that. And so the market expanded. Uh, when the market expands, initially, there's a blip on the demand side because the demand also expands. The cost of getting this has gone down. But in response to the demand, that stabilizes pretty soon. And in the long run, there's wage compression that happens because the market has expanded and there's, there are a lot more people competing for that same job. So the first impact of augmentation can happen across a wide range of tools. but And that's what I call uh, skill commoditization. Your skill gets commoditized. But the second impact of augmentation happens, especially in the case of learning tools as, you know, with AI, for instance. The second impact is what I call, uh, you know, skill absorption. Your skill gets absorbed because you're constantly training the AI. The more you use uh, the AI in partnership as a co-pilot with yourself, the more you are training it. Uh, think of um, doctors using uh, AI. Increasingly, AI is getting better and yeah. better at yeah. doing diagnosis. So doctors using AI, they're constantly telling the AI what's a good diagnosis, what's not. And all of that training is helping the, doc uh, the, the AI actually absorb the knowledge of doctors at scale. The more absorption that happens, the better the AI becomes. And because of that, the skill level at which somebody can enter that field goes down even lower because with AI, you don't need that extra skill to come in. Now, that sounds very good. It sounds like it democratizes, lowers the barrier. But the point is that eventually that compresses the wage. There's more players competing for the same pie. Uh, and what we've seen even with previous uh, technologies is that, yes, when the supply increases because your skill levels go down, the demand increases as a result. But over time, eventually the, the ability for suppliers to negotiate or workers to negotiate goes down because a lot of the advantages of the increased demand accrues to the points at which supply is 
is uh, uh, you know concentrated either inside a factory so to the factory owner or at a platform because it is managing all of these players the the, the additional demand advantage does not go back to the workers so the workers eventually suffer from wage compression so that's the second piece right the third piece is about the point of concentration in the past the point of concentration used to be factories so if a geographical you, location a geographical location and you know essentially uh, over there, the advantage was that uh, basically these uh, uh, players who could uh, or, or capitalists who could concentrate um, all, all the supply uh, and sufficiently market it to the demand could could benefit from that advantage. But there were limits to how much they could scale versus today. What happens, the third component is that technology itself is the point of concentration. And Uber is a great example of this, because yeah. if you think of Uber, GPS brought down the, the skill. And so skill commoditization happened. The more we use Google Maps, the more it improves. And so skill absorption happens to some extent. And then eventually, Uber drivers today are completely replaceable. You don't care who comes. It's about the closest driver that comes, because the technology has uh, kind of leveled the skill levels that are required to the bare minimum possible. And so that's a, it's a combination of these three things, skill commoditization, skill absorption, and centralized market making that eventually absorbs negotiating power away from the workers. And, and that's the long-term advantage, you know, the long-term effects of any form of augmentation, especially with AI. So these three elements, you know, commoditization, reduction in wages because of commoditization of the skill and the unlimited ability of a platform to produce supply, you know, yep. uh, which was different from a factory environment where supply was limited to the extent of its uh, physical structure or its, you know, there are limits to how big a factory can be or how, how many workers can a single factory manage. But that those dynamics do not play into the platform world. Yeah. Now, now this is in, and because the platform is now an AI platform, uh, this will certainly have an impact on both productivity and GDP because wages will get depressed. If wages get depressed, I am assuming they will have a short term, mid term impact on GDP. Now the <clears throat> the tech titans would have us believe that it will increase productivity and in the long term, it will have a good impact on the GDP growth per se. What is your view on this issue? I think this is where uh, I, I believe that uh, when these three factors come into play together, you are effectively hollowing out the premium that uh, a skilled worker could enjoy. And uh, most of the middle class, what we call the middle class today, is essentially skilled workers. They're different, you know, di di you, you're essentially, if you are in the middle class, if you're not a capitalist, if you are in the middle class and you're not, you know, struggling to make ends meet, you have to some, ex you have to some extent, you've essentially uh, gathered a, a skill and you're charging a premium for that skill. That's what's helping you stay above, uh, you know, uh, the level of, you uh, basic sustenance and that's uh, and because you're still relying on the skill that's preventing you from getting into the capitalists right so if you just think of it in those terms i know those are very simplified simplistic terms but my key point is that most of us are really charging a premium for our skill that's what what we do at work once your ability to charge a premium for that skill goes down it's not just the gdp that gets impacted it's even your motivation to work that starts going down you might have work your work doesn't go away ai won't eat your job but will 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 that job be worth doing will you will it be worth investing in a career because ultimately we're all working towards a career where we're constantly learning to improve that skill premium right and whether that skill premium means an increased wage or increased opportunity or increased negotiating power of some sort but without that skill premium that 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 uh, uh, you know uh, inherent need to advance in our careers will go away so so that's the you know one part on uh, which i believe kind of uh, vanishes with this kind of a dynamic and then if you hollow out the middle class in the long run, you're not really helping the GDP. You are going to hollow out consumption. You're going to end up driving concentration in one direction. So all of those factors, um, I, I don't really agree with the uh, logic that eventually productivity gains will solve for that problem.
in this situation and in this kind of environment, you know, we have, of course, the, uh, uh, you know, people who oppose AI are seen as techno luddits and they're seen as people who are naysayers to improvement of productivity and technology growth. <clears throat> and people say that this is, uh, is like any other technology or any other technological tool and it will evolve and create new jobs. Uh, what should be the role, one, of the government? And secondly, what should be the role of civil society? Um, and I wanted you to play on both these roles uh, in the AI world. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I, I have, uh, just uh, before I answer that question, I have a point of view on um, this piece about AI increasing jobs. I'm not necessarily sure if AI fundamentally increases jobs where uh, you have uh, a better opportunity to uh, uh, gain a, uh, a better wage for your skill premium. Uh, what I do feel AI can do, which has not happened with necessarily to the same extent or in, at, at the same, uh, in the same numbers with previous tools, every time a new technology comes in, you have a new form of capitalism that comes in around that technology. I, I believe that because of the widespread nature of AI, because of the fact that all of us can have access to technology, which in the past used to have, uh, you know, probably only be with large companies, but now all of us will have access to that level of assistance and productivity enhancing technologies. The ability for some of the skilled workers to move into becoming you know, quasi-capitalists will be massively distributed. Whether we understand the, the, the rules that are required to move in that direction or not, uh, those are certain things that we still have to see out, uh, play out. But over the next 10 to 12 years, I, I would see many more single person, dual person companies coming up just because a lot of the productivity gains are achieved through AI and there's a layer of creativity on top that these one or two people do. So that to me is not a new job. It's a, it's it's moving the worker into capitalism. And that I think will become more widespread with AI, but but not uh, otherwise, um, not not jobs as such. If you're just looking, looking to see a new job coming up because of AI, that's not uh, really going to happen uh, to the same extent as the commodification happens. Um, going back to your point, uh, you know, what is the uh, role of uh, governments in this uh, scenario, as, as you mentioned, right? Um, so the, the first thing over here is to ensure that um, you, you think about, uh, you know, the, the ideal and the best and the long-term answer uh, is always you have to re-educate, you have to re-skill uh, your uh, society. But we've seen that even with small country, that's extremely difficult to achieve. E achieving that with policy, you see people, uh, you know, gain some check marks, but it does not fundamentally re-skill. The first thing that governments can potentially do in this direction is think about where um, technology is, uh, where, te you know, which forms of mass technology are having this, type of uh, are creating this type of wage pressure and figure out a new way to tax that technology i'm usually uh, you know not a pro tax uh, uh, thinker because uh, you know tax to a large extent is a very horizontal solution and it ends up uh, axing many things that should not be axed but especially in this specific case where if you see a potential for horizontal uh, commoditization of jobs across a wide range of industries, across a wide range of skill levels. Those are the places where, you know, uh, creating some kind of a tax premium on players that are uh, uh, players whose technology is uh, uh, driving this level of commoditization would be one way to think about, you know, how you can... Give me a, give me a more specific example here, Sankit, because this is an interesting idea. So are you saying that, say... Uh... So Google's new AI engine Gemini has commoditized jobs for uh, commoditizes designers' jobs because it allows anybody to create an image, okay, or uh, allows anybody to design something without having the skill to design an image. You know, how would taxation happen? Is that what you're talking about? Would yeah. So, so, so there, there are two aspects to it. One is that, you know, something like Gemini is reducing the skill level and so is um, 
allowing many more players to come on board. Uh, the second is where do these uh, players, uh, uh, you know, what are the uh, what are the market makers that uh, manage these new designers that come on board? These new design to to the extent, and I think taxation is. Uh, a specifically uh, viable solution here to the extent that the player that provides the AI also makes the market, right? If Google also provides Gemini and also creates the market uh, place for uh, these new Gemini aided designers to find uh, um, jobs to the extent that these two are integrated in the same company, I, I think there's a clear case for taxing that particular uh, company because you are both uh, expanding the market and you are controlling the demand that gets access to the market. So you, unless you uh, provide some kind of skill premium back to the designers, which you don't have any incentive to do, the other way to do it would be to uh, essentially create some kind of a tax through which a benefit can be delivered back to the users on that marketplace. So my key point over here is that when you see a combination of these three things, where you have skill commoditization, you have skill absorption, and you have market making happening together. You're essentially saying that all the workers within that confluence, their skill premium is moving to the market maker. So there has to be some way of transferring that value back to the workers. So in this case, it's a closed loop. It's much easier to tax something like this. When it becomes an open loop, where Google creates Gemini, and then the workers work on th other third-party platforms, then taxation may be more nuanced. But the same, I would apply the same principle over there as well, because through a combination of these three effects. So you designer, are... Say, suppose a designer works on an Adobe platform, okay, and Adobe has now integrated AI into Adobe and it allows you to create faster and easier and this thing. So, if Adobe is commoditizing designers, this thing, one thinking is that data of designer or data of creators should be controlled and they should have far greater control over their data. And if data is used by an AI, there should be a compensation back to the creator. No, how, I think that's how plausible, how uh, uh, implementable is this uh, way of thinking? Yeah, so so I, I want to clarify that what I was talking about was more about uh, taxing the extraction that happens because of the commoditization. Uh, that that I feel, uh, you, you, I mean, obviously that's a different uh, issue from um, whether creators should be compensated for training AI. I I feel uh, this this whole uh, paradigm of making of essentially compensating creators for training AI is is going to be a challenge in itself because uh, because of multiple factors. There's it's difficult to determine to what extent. Uh, a particular creator has, uh, uh, you know, a, a particular creator's data has been used for. Uh, no, take, take take a very simple example. All creators, everything that has been created has been digitized, mm -hmm. and everything that is digitized is data. And your book is data now. Okay, now an AI does learn platform, any everything about platform economics or most of the things about platform economics and platform evolution forms. Like Sangeet spoke. You don't have any ownership over the, the fact that now you, your book has been used to train an AI engine because you don't have any control over an, your digital data in that sense, you know, uh, sure. uh, particularly in an AI world. Same thing applies to a designer. Same thing applies to anybody who writes anything or anybody who creates anything or anybody who shares a, anything on a digital platform. And this is where the combination of digital platforms and AI is so very insidious in that sense because absorption of data is no longer happening with tacit approval or tacit control of the creator. So hence the thinking is that data control should come back to the individual and data control should be more, uh, is the way to regulate or uh, control the AI's ability to absorb these skills. So I think you know uh, there are two different issues in a, in my uh, view. Um, can, can giving data control back to the user help the user? Absolutely. But can data giving data control back to the user fundamentally, um, you know, help us control uh, the the AI? I I'm uh, or help us control the uh, the effect the, the the limits to which 
uh, AI has power. Uh, I, 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 I find that a little more difficult to uh, accept because uh, the way I would think about, you know, data control coming back to the user is that the user gets more agency about how the user applies marginal use of their data. What what use cases does the, the user, user open up their data for? And is the user now getting a, a good bargain in exchange for that data? So the user gets some, some uh, you know, definitely gets additional value over there, whether it comes back in the form of actual uh, monetization or whether it comes back in the form of additional value in the form of, you know, highly specialized personalization because I opened out a specific form of data. Um, the user gets some value over there, but having, uh, you know, a, it's difficult to now go back and say all the, all, all the training on foundational models that has happened has to be undone. And we have to, uh, you know, uh, figure out a way to compensate, uh, the data providers, uh, based on which the foundational models have been uh, uh, created. And if that cannot be done, then what we're talking about is really the incremental training that can happen with users opening up their data. So I don't think that's really going to impact the power of AI as such. Uh, it is going to impact to some extent the agency that users have. Eventually, you know, if, if we go back to this, uh, the idea of, uh, you know, the, the data surplus that essentially in the age of Facebook, Amazon, et cetera, we've always been doing a data surplus. They're taking more data than they need to give back value to us. You could say that once data control comes back to us, the data surplus goes away. The amount of data will we give is worth the value that comes back to us. But does it take the platform? So I don't think so because the the now shift to the think about you know as we move forward that interface is going to be run by ai agents and ai agents working on our behalf to share data to uh to with specific programs and give back value back to us and essentially just like in the previous era uh, of social media uh, these uh, large platforms perfected the art of hooking you and making you constantly uh, you know swipe your screen and move your infinite scroll etc essentially they uh, perfected behavior design, they, the competition or competitive advantage will move to them perfecting the art of ensuring that they provide sufficient value and you, uh, you know, the friction for you to uh, open up your data goes down. So my key point is that the agency definitely comes back to the user on the marginal data that they open, the data surplus goes away, but I don't really see that def necessarily affecting the power of the AI unless there's some counter force uh, from a regulatory perspective.